This is Real Estate Rookie episode 203. I believe that that the property manager needs to be seen, but I'm also the type of person that I'm a hands-on kind of property manager. And, you know, years ago, I'd go up on the roof and go in the basements and who knows where. But my point being that you're much more involved and you get much more of the actual detail when you're there on site when something's happening. You know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, the property manager needs to be out on the property, not in the office. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the stories inspiration and information you need to kickstart your investing journey. And uh, part of what we do on this show is we ask our, our loyal listeners to leave us honest rating and reviews. And Ash always gives me like a hard time when I say honest because uh, some of you are more honest than others. So I just want to read a review we got in recently that uh, that gave us a gave us a good laugh. So um, you, you know, you can give a title for your for your review. And the title for this one says boring. Uh, this is a one star review uh, from Masael underscore M. And most of the guests uh, that they have on the show seem like interesting people, but can't help to not acknowledge how boring Tony slash Ashley make the conversation. They should really know how to ask better questions. So uh, <laughs> I guess we've got to focus on our, our, our banter, Ashley, and our ability to ask good questions. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. something for us to work on. Yeah. Um, you know what? There's always room for improvement. Uh, we can take yeah. constructive criticism. Um, <laughs> so, I would just rather you you DM it to me and not publicly <laughs> 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 put it on as a review. <laughs> well, now on to our boring banter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's new yeah. with you? Um, yeah, you know, what? I'm actually going back to Las Vegas uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, good friends of mine, they're getting married in September and their their bachelor and bachelorette party is uh, is this weekend. So taking off again to, to Vegas and uh, spend the next few days out there. So Ash, I know you're going to be in Coeur d'Alene, but if for whatever reason you, you feel like another Vegas pool party, just know you're you're more than welcome to join us. I'll uh, fly my kids out to Coeur d'Alene, leave them there for a leave day, them drop there. them off. Exactly. <laughs> I'll, I'll trust them with Ryan Murdoch to babysit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good time. So, um, yeah, just the us traveling a lot. It's been really cool to just be with other investors. Um, I don't know about you, Tony, but in your small cow town of Ontario, California, are there a lot of uh, investors near you that you can actually network with and hang out besides like going to like the big meetups that you put on? Yeah. Um, you know, I actually do have a few friends that, that live nearby that, that invest in real estate. But yeah, like you said, we've been doing our own totally free meetup. So if you guys want to know about those, just follow me on Instagram at Tony J. Robinson. Uh, we've done two of them now. We're planning to do them every month. And we've had about 200 people show up to, to, to each one of the meetups. So that's been really cool because um, it, it's it's cool to kind of be the person creating the community, you know, and I know there are a lot of folks that don't have that connection. So to be the one kind of facilitating, that's been pretty cool. And if you don't have that connection, do what Tony is doing and create your own meetup. Do it yourself. Uh, you, do, <laughs> you don't have to have a following or a platform. You can post it on biggerpockets.com in the forums. Mm-hmm. There is a place specific for hosting events and meetups in there and uh, the one that I go to in Buffalo every once in a while, that one, I mean, just started out with maybe like two or three people showing up, but he consistently did it, Eric, every single month. And I think it's been going on maybe three, four years now um, mm. and gr- huge, great turnout now. So um, stay consistent. And then you can use kind of that meetup to your advantage and opportunities for yourself. So, oh, you want to learn about private money? Okay. Who wants to be a speaker at my event <laughs> and talk about <laughs> private money and then bring them in? <laughs> yeah. Totally. So today we actually are talking about project management. So we are bringing on Karen, who works for a professional manage- property management company. She is not an investor herself yet. So at the end, we try to give her some advice and help her get started in her journey. But we thought it would be interesting instead of bringing on an investor who is a property manager, bring on somebody who works uh, at a property management company and kind of get some insight as to what to look for in a property management company, um, fees and everything you need to know about the, the management agreement too. 
Yeah, I mean, this was like a, a master class on property management. Like if we go back to our episodes with James Daynard about flipping houses and scope of works, like this is equivalent, but for property management, like it, it's that good level of information that she gives out about how to vet property managers, how to be a good property manager as an owner, what you should look for, like just so many, so many, so many, so many good pieces throughout this entire conversation. Yeah. And if you want to learn even more about property management, uh, there is going to be a new Bigger Pockets boot camp released this fall that is specific on property management. So maybe you took the rookie boot camp with me and you got your first deal and now you need to know how to manage it. Manage it. This uh, boot camp is for you and it will be hosted uh, by myself. So I'm in the middle of kind of creating uh, the course structure and all of the content for that, but I'm really excited about it. So if you guys want to check that out, you can go to biggerpockets.com forward slash boot camps. Welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, can you start off with telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in real estate? Well, unfortunately, I've been in property management, commercial specifically, for longer than I care to admit to. Um, <laughs> I started long ago and far away as um, a leasing assistant and then from there moved up and became a property manager. And I've kind of been trapped in that ever since. <laughs> <laughs> But I've, you know, I've had a, I've had a really good career. I've worked for a lot of different types of investors, from private investors all the way up to REITs, and I've, you know, traveled the world. I've actually um, worked on, you know, both coasts of the United States, and as well, I've worked internationally, including Dubai. Man, well, your your property management adventures seem much more exciting than, than Ashley's. I don't know, have, have you have yours <laughs> taken you to Dubai, Ashley? I mean, mine took me to a small, tiny little office with no windows, no air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It had its own bathroom attached. <laughs> hey, that's better than what I had. I had one that was like a pie-shaped cut between an elevator shaft and a garbage compactor. Well, well, Karen, I mean, your, your story is unique. And this is why we wanted to bring you on is because you, you haven't started investing yourself in real estate, but you have this tremendous amount of experience dealing with everything related to real estate, right? So you, you, right. you have experience working with investors, uh, you have experience dealing with tenants and managing the properties, but, but now you're, you're ready to kind of take that leap and start investing yourself. So before we kind of get into your journey about the, the investing side, we really just wanted to be able to pick your brain for our listeners about, uh, property management. I think there are so many rookies who are listening right now that, you know, have this desire to become a real estate investor, but the idea of managing tenants and kind of dealing with the issues that comes along with that has them stuck a little bit. So we're hoping that with you and, and your wealth of knowledge and experience can kind of ease the, the fears or maybe reinforce some of those fears, <laughs> but at least give them some solutions um, when it comes to, to property management. So I think the first thing that we want to start with, Karen, is in your own definition, what does it mean to be a property manager? Um, I would have to say that, you know, you're basically a firefighter because you're putting out crises or perceived crises um, constantly. You're answering to different factions. You know, you've got owners, you've got your contractors and your vendors, and then, of course, you've got your tenants. And so you're always juggling. So... Well, you know, you, you said perceived crises. I think that's a that's a really like telling word. Can you can you elaborate on that? Like, what does that what does that part mean? The perceived crises? Well, I think that, you know, you've you've got tenants that in their mind, it's a crisis. It's the end of the world. You know, say, for instance, like if their air conditioning breaks, um, whereas, you know, those of us that deal with it on a daily basis, and Ashley, I'm sure, you know, it's like, okay, we know the steps. We have to call the vendor. We have to get somebody out there. We have to assess it. So that's what pretty much what I mean by perceived crises. You know, I mean, I've had actual crises, but to me, most of them, it's just a matter of perception. Karen, let's talk about the relationship you have with the property owner. So the property manager, they deal with the tenants, but they also deal with the property owner. Can you kind of talk about how that is set up? Um, what does that relationship look like between a property owner and a property manager? 
Well, it varies, um, but I would say a lot of it is dependent on the owner. Um, I would want someone that's looking for the same goals as the owner, that's going to take a pride of ownership um, and really be transparent and tell them, you know, this is what I can do, this is what I can't do, you know, and a lot of that is just that rapport, building that rapport with them to say, you know, what do you want to see with this property? You know, do you want to see the aesthetics improved? Do you want to see the leasing improved? You know, how is it that you see this particular investment of yours, you know, prospering? And then take what that owner wants and create a plan to do that. Before we go any further, because I think as we get into talking about property management, there might be some people that are intrigued by it and either thinking they want to do it for their own properties or that they want to go out and manage other people's properties. Can anybody be a property manager or how do you become one? Uh, that's one of the things that I would like to stress is not anyone can be a property manager. A lot of the states have licensing requirements and even, you know, your cities and your counties have business licensing requirements. Um, it's also, you know, not as easy as people think it is. You know, once you get into the day to day, because you've got a lot of financial accounting and, you know, you've got to be able to analyze, say, a budget and create a budget versus, you know, knowing where you're going to have to make repairs. You're going to need a basic mechanical knowledge. And then you're also going to have to know how to read a lease and read a management agreement. So Karen, you, you talked about a lot of different aspects of, of property management. So is is the property manager the one person that does everything? So like, is the, you know, say that I'm the owner and there's an issue, like there's a leak at the property. Is the property manager the one that's actually going going out there to, to fix the leak if a unit needs to be turned? Are they the one that's turning the unit? Like, I guess what is, you know, are they the ones that are writing and creating the the lease documents? Like how much of it falls on the, on the PM themselves or how much is kind of outsourced to other folks? Well, the PM is basically, you know, the responsible party. And it's up to them to see to it that they've got people in place. For instance, if there's, you know, a maintenance issue or something, that they've got the people in place to call to get that taken care of. As far as the leases go, we always recommend that the leases are drafted by an attorney because as real estate brokers, we're not allowed to draft legal documents and that they're reviewed and approved by the owner as well. Interesting. So the, the PM is kind of like the, the quarterback and they're, they're kind of running plays for, for the rest of the team to make sure that the property's being taken care of. Correct. Yeah. Okay. We, we, have to, we have to be like the buck stops with us, you know, and I mean, there's been times when I've actually had to be out there on the property at two o'clock in the morning just to make sure that everything was handled. Was that a perceived uh, issue or, or a real <laughs> issue? That two o'clock. No, that one, that one, that one was a real issue. That was an 18 okay. inch water main break. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess that's an issue. I guess that's an issue. Yeah, especially when you've got all your uh, electrical equipment in the basement of the building. Karen, th so there are some things that you need to know if you are going to be a property manager. Uh, for somebody that's an investor, what are what do they need to ask? How do they vet? How do they find a property manager and make sure that they're going to do everything correctly and follow some of the rules and regulations you talk to, find out that they're licensed and that they can actually manage the property from your perspective? What's some advice you can give that they can use to vet a property manager? I would say, you know, one your property manager should have some references, you know, so that they could talk to other clients of that property manager and know how they're handling the property for other investors. Um, as far as licensing goes, you can look that up on the state's websites. And you can also look up and see if they've ever been disciplined by the real estate commission. The other thing I would say is, you know, as an investor, I would ask that, you know, like I said earlier, you kind of want to tell them this is what my vision is. And so, you know, what do you think I can do to accomplish that vision? 
and then listen and see what they come back with. You want somebody that's going to really, you know, take the time to understand your vision as an investor, but also understand what the limitations of the particular property may be. You know, you may have a property that's out in a tertiary market and, you know, they want sales to increase a hundred percent or they want, you know, leasing in six months and it may not be possible. And you want somebody that's going to be honest and tell you, you know, no, I can't do this, but I can do this, you know, and, and I think, you know, building that rapport and having that conversation and a lot of discussion before actually saying, this is who I'm going to sign with. I think the other thing too, as an investor is you need to be aware of what the limitations of the property manager are, as well as what your limitations as an owner are. Karen, what a, like what a eloquently uh, laid out uh, <laughs> like response to that, that question, man. I, I feel like I'm learning a lot about PMs right now as well. Um, so you, you <laughs> talked about them having the references, that the licenses, being able to kind of share in your vision, understanding mm -hmm. the market, the local market, and, and kind of what's possible and what's not. But I also want to go back to the point that you, that you brought up about, you know, you being at the property at two o'clock in the morning when this water main line burst. Why do you feel it's important for a property manager to, to show up for the tenants? I believe that that the property manager needs to be seen, but I'm also the type of person that I'm a hands-on kind of property manager. And, you know, years ago, I'd go up on the roof and go in the basements and who knows where. But my point being that you've, you're much more involved and you get much more of the actual detail when you're there on site when something's happening. You know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, the property manager needs to be out on the property, not in the office. Karen, I have a question about that. So as the, the owner, is that costing them any extra on top of the percentage that they're paying for you to go out of the office and go to the, the building? So the property management company I use now, they have the property manager and then they have maintenance and maintenance charges an hourly rate. Well, anything that needs to be done at the facility, so say maybe an appraiser needs to be met, they have one of the maintenance guys so they can charge that hourly rate. How does it work for you? And what do you see that's kind of standard? Would you be the one that actually goes out? And is there an additional fee usually for the property manager to come to the property? Or do you think that should be included in that percentage that is paid? I think it should be included. I know from a commercial point of view, um, it's usually included. You're basically on call 24 seven. And, you know, unless there's something out of the ordinary, that's an expense for the property, you, you know, you don't bill for, you know, emergencies and, and after hours stuff. Now with maintenance, you know, depending on what route you go, whether you have in-house maintenance or you contract out, then that's going to determine, you know, whether the property is going to be billed additionally or not. So you mentioned that you like to go to the properties to like show your face to the tenants and like show that you're involved and you can see for yourself and that keeps a good line of, uh, would you say like respect with the tenants that, you know, you are actually putting an effort to come to the property? Well, it, you know, I find that, that it, it's not only respect, but communication because I can tell you probably Every time I go out to a property and I go visit tenants and I ask, you know, hey, how's everything going? Do you need anything? They'll give me something that, you know, a roof leak or something. Whereas if I wait for them to call me and tell me that they've got a roof leak, nine times out of 10, it, it won't happen. And more damage is probably already done. Because oh, already yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> how, how are you keeping that? happy medium and like walking that fine line of keeping the landlord, the owner happy, and also keeping the tenant happy. Um, you know, for instance, I had this tenant that there was a water leak because there was something wrong with the roof and she had her insurance to cover her personal items. And the, the owner didn't want to pay for her personal items to be replaced because she's supposed to have insurance on it. 
How are you dealing with issues like that where the tenant may want something done or something covered and the landlord is saying no? How do you keep both happy? Is it just strict, you know, standing by the lease and staying strict to that? How do you keep a good relationship with both? Yeah, I would say that, you know, the lease definitely is, is, you know, the Bible, we, you know, it's blame everything on the lease. (laughs) Yeah. Blame everything on the lease. Um, but you know, a lot of it too is, is you got to know the owner, you know, like I've got some owners that they'd rather get the rent late than not get it at all. You know, others that are like, okay, charge late fees the minute that they're late. Um, a lot of it has to do with just talking through and educating them. You know, I think a lot of it, you have to educate the tenant because they don't read the leases. They sign them, but they don't know what's in them. And it, you got to, you know, basically say, look, I'm sorry, but, you know, per the lease, you are responsible for your personal belongings. You know, um, I run into it a lot because we have a lot of triple net leases and, you know, we've got people in older buildings with air conditioners that go out and it's like they call us up and they're like, oh, the air conditioner has to be replaced. And I have to be the one to say, sorry, uh, you know, that's your responsibility. Now, sometimes they'll come back and, and, you know, we'll talk to the owner and maybe the owner might split the cost or something. And, but a lot of times what most of my owners do is they'll tie it to something like say, for instance, you know, they've got a $20,000 air conditioning unit that has to be replaced. The owner will throw in and say, okay, I'll replace it, but I want you to extend your lease another three years. So Karen, I I, I want to go back really quickly. You mentioned the word triple net lease. Can you define what that is and how that's different from a standard lease? Well, a standard lease is what we call gross. And that basically means that all your your expenses and everything, that's included in the price that you're paying. The triple net lease means that just about all of the operating expenses for the property are passed through to the tenants based on what we use as their pro rata share, which is basically the percentage of the total of the property that they occupy. Yeah. So like we'll be a good example of something that you would have to con- cover under a, a triple net lease that you wouldn't have to under a gross lease. Like what are some things that, that you become responsible for under a triple net lease? Well, under a triple net lease, you're res- basically responsible for the four walls in, mm-hmm. um, and the landlord is pretty much only responsible for the parking lot and the roof. Right, right. So if your air conditioner goes out, you're responsible for it. Um, roof leak, the landlord's responsible to fix the leak, but if it damages anything in your personal property, then it's your responsibility to pay for that. Yeah, just to add to that, another thing too is the maintenance in the inside, like Karen said, but also the property taxes. If it's just a, you know, a single commercial building, you could be responsible for all the property taxes there, which I think is a great advantage as the property owner, because as property taxes increase, that's on the tenant and not you. And then also um, insurance, they usually have to cover uh, a a bigger insurance policy than just a a renter's insurance policy um, on the property too, which can significantly decrease um, the cost for the the property owner too. So it's Mm -hmm. usually the triple net leases, the the maintenance, the property taxes, and the insurance um, added on that the owner no longer has to pay. And if there is a a building that has different, you know, different units in it, it is prorated, like Karen said, that, you know, you'll pay this percentage of the property taxes because you have this much square footage of the building um, on that. So that's a, a triple net lease. For you guys. So if you're looking for a commercial, learn about triple net leases because they, they can be a great advantage. I don't own any commercial real estate yet, but I've uh, experienced triple net leases as the tenant. So in my day job, um, we rented like, you know, these big, massive, like, you know, 500,000 to a million square foot warehouses. And they were all triple net leases. And I remember at one point we had this issue where like the, there were these polished concrete floors. We have these big, like, you know, like these forklifts and all this other industrial equipment that's driving on it. And the, the floor started to crack. Like there were these, these pockets in the, in the, in the floor of the concrete. And we tried to go back to the, to the, to the uh, landlord to say, Hey, like this, the floor is crumbling. And they tried to argue that it was like, Hey, 
it's a triple net lease. You guys have to do that yourself. And we tried to argue that it was technically the foundation that was around. Anyway, so yeah, <laughs> triple net leases are great for uh, for uh, for landlords, maybe a little less so for, for the tenants. Um, so Karen, I, I want to continue on. Um, you, you've shared so much good information so far, but I, I want to dig into the the relationship between the 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 uh, property manager and the owner. Okay, like what is that? How, like, is it just a handshake agreement? Um, and you you guys are buddies, and we're just going to do this, you know, because I trust you and you trust me. Or there's some ways to to solidify and legitimize this relationship between the owner and the property manager. Well, there's usually always a management agreement, and it's a contract between the owner and the property management company. Um, those are standard in our industry. As much as we love everybody. We can't do anything on a handshake because then it's going to be, well, the way I heard it, you were offering me this. And one of the things that a, a management agreement will outline is it will outline what the responsibilities of the property manager are, as well as what the responsibilities of the owner are. You know, there are other fees that property managers can get, and those are spelled out usually in the management agreement, whether it's leasing fees or project management fees or management fees themselves. And the percentage of the management fees is always spelled out. So I, I want to dig into to the fees a little bit more. Um, but before I do, you said a, a lease up fee. I get maybe let's do it this way. Like, what are all those different fees you just listed? Like, what's a lease up fee? Like, if you can define those for us, because I'm sure a lot of rookies listening maybe didn't know that there were these additional fees you might have to pay. Well, you've you've got your first and foremost, you got your management fee. That's based on your gross income that you receive, you know, or, or that the manager collects for the owner every month. Then you've got leasing fees, which are usually based on whether it's a new lease or whether it's a renewal of an existing lease. And those, you know, range from anywhere from 2% for renewals to 6% for new leases. Um, then after that, you've got project management fees, which are usually based on a cost of, say, like, you know, zero to $250,000 might be 6%, you know, 250,000 to 500,000 might be, you know, 5% and down the line or something. Um, those are all spelled out and that project management fees have to do with like when you get owners that want to rehab a property and they buy it and say they want to replace the roofs, they want to redo the parking lot, you know, that's a fee that the property manager is entitled to because they're basically acting as a construction project manager and overseeing that. They're getting the bids on everything. They're, you know, checking out the contractors, making sure they're insured, you know, and getting the contracts actually executed. So there's there's a lot that a property manager can do for, for an owner, which I think is good because I, I think a lot of new investors don't realize how, if you find the right property manager, how wide ranging of, of, of type of services they can offer to you as the owner. Uh, I, I want to drill in a little bit, Karen, into the into the compensation. But before I do, Ash, like any any thoughts on you and all these different things that that property managers can do? Yeah, I just had uh, one question on it. So, with the the property management fees, how can somebody as a, a a landlord, the property owner, what are some things they should be looking for to know what the fees are upfront? Is this you know will they get usually an attached schedule with all the fees listed in there? And are there ways to hide fees that, um, you know, the property owner should be looking for? Well, I personally don't think there's too many ways to hide fees. You know, if yeah. you've got an owner that actually goes through that management agreement and you make sure everything's spelled out, um, there's always stuff, I guess, that could come up. But that would be one that the owner would then talk to the property manager and discuss it. Um as far as the fees go, they should all be on a schedule in the property management agreement. And, you know, like I said, they should be spelled out exactly, you know, what they're based on and how often they can be paid. And then, you know, what we always do is we include in our management agreement, you know, all of the things that we as the property manager are going to provide you as the owner. 
And that's, you know, not only site visits, but, you know, we have the accounting side of it and financial reports and budgets, as well as the maintenance and the tenant relations. I think understanding those fees is so important because you can look at uh, you know, say, oh, I'm property manager, 6%. And even using the bigger pockets calculator reports or a lot of a, a calculator analysis to analyze a deal, they have that property management fee. So you talk to property managers, they say, oh, we charge, you know, 8%. So you plug in that 8%, but a lot of times there's going to be more fees than that included. So you want to bump up that percentage when you are analyzing your deals because those things will um, come up, those fees will come up, they will need to be factored in um, to your numbers. So I think that's really important to know those upfront and not just that base percentage that is being paid. And also, I think when you're interviewing a property management company, along with getting that schedule that you mentioned, Karen, is figuring out, asking some questions as to what their process or their system is when they are interviewing them. So for example, you can ask, what happens when a tenant calls for maintenance? Or if they have a maintenance issue, how does the, the tenant even submit the maintenance request? And then what does the process look like until the maintenance is completed and finished? So I think um, kind of understanding that process, um, you know, if the, the landlord needs to, you know, put in money because he wants to do a, a big rehab on it, how does that process work? Does he have to meet them with cash? Can he send it electronically? So asking all these processes, I think is really important and will get you a good understanding of how smoothly the property management company actually works. And if it's going to be a great experience for your tenant, because if there's not those systems in place, tenants are going to be very unhappy when they put in a maintenance request and 48 hours later, they haven't even received a phone call to schedule it. Um, so that that's another thing that I would make sure that you're understanding before you sign those management agreements too. That is so true because, you know, the, you want to make sure that you've got somebody that's going to respond to your tenants, you know, within 24 hours is basically the way I look at it. You know, you can't leave people hanging. Yeah. And even if you're not, you're scheduling them or even if you're not coming to do the maintenance in 24 hours, at least that communication to say, Hey, I have somebody that can come on Thursday at one o'clock. Does that work for you? And I think that if as long as they're able to keep communicating and not just wait like, oh, well, we don't have anyone for another week. So we're not even going to talk to the tenant for two weeks or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's having those work order systems, having the accounting systems, all the different, you know, systems you need to have those in place. And as an owner, like you said, Ashley, you know, you want to see what it is that this property manager is going to do and produce for you. Yeah. And one thing I just thought of too, is to ask along with the work orders, but what is the communication between departments too? So like, do you have the property manager? Do you have the leasing agent? Then do you have the maintenance department? Do you have the maintenance coordinators? I had this uh, apartment recently that was uh, renovated and um, some of the rehab was actually being done by somebody outside of the property management company. And an email was sent to the maintenance saying, you know, I know you guys finished your part. We have another contractor. That part is finished. Please send it to leasing. It was never sent to leasing. And that apartment sat and was never listed until we were like, wait, what's going on with this apartment? And go back and look. And there's not a listing online. There's nothing. We reach out and they're like, oh, sorry, it never got communicated between maintenance and leasing that it was ready to go. So I think that's a, another big issue too, to, to watch yeah, out for. Kind of, kind of like your, you know, your project management, you know, you've got to have it phased in and you got to know where in that process everything is at all times. Yeah. So both of you have made some really great points, uh, especially about the fees. So I, I want to just drill into that before we move on to, to our next point here. Um, let, let me ask both of you a question. Ashley, what's like the, the going management fee percentage in Buffalo, in the Buffalo area? Um, it's about 10% unless you have a large portfolio of properties. So right now I'm paying 6%. Okay. And Karen, what, what is it? And sorry, I don't think we stated, what, can you let us know what part of the country you're in? And then what are the, the average management fees for like single family, small multifamily in that area? I'm actually in the Charlotte market. And so I would say more so in the 
single family, multifamily, I'd probably say six to 10%, but I could be wrong. Um, only because I don't really do a lot of multifamily. Um, from a commercial standpoint, the standard is about 4%. Okay. So different, you know, management fees and different markets, I think is, is typical. Um, so if I'm a, if I'm an investor and I'm, I'm looking at a potential property manager, how can I make sure that their fees are reasonable? Like what steps should I take Karen? And actually I want to hear your, your opinion afterwards, but Karen, what should I, what steps should I take to make sure that the fees that I'm being charged are reasonable for that, for that area? Well, I think, you know, easily you could just call you know several property management companies and ask them what their fees are but you know talking to other investors you'll also get feedback from them not only recommendations of companies but as well as you know oh this is what i'm paying um i think that's the main easiest way to figure it out is just you know different networks yeah i would say there's it, when you're in the, you already have the property manager. So, you know, shopping around, just like Karen said, and like seeing what other people are charging. But once you actually have the property manager, there still is going to be some oversight as to make sure those fees are allocated correctly. Uh, so I've had, you know, and these are just human errors where I've had a property that sold and I got charged their minimum $25 a month fee because there was no rental income because the property sold, but I was still charged that. And I just had to go and email and say, you know, can you please remove that? And it was fine. But I did not realize when I took on a property management company, how much asset management there still was. Um, and so I have Daryl who helps me with this and he oversees all of the maintenance, all of the rehabs. And he had seen uh, a quote to paint an apartment for a one bedroom. And then he saw it to quote a two bedroom. And he's like, why is the one or the one bedroom way more expensive than the two bedroom? And then adding it up, the maintenance person that was working for them and quoting them was just throwing out numbers, no rhyme or reason as to quoting the paint. And you know, that's, it's a growing property management company in large. So it's not, you know, it's that one person's fault. It's not, you know, the whole company as a whole. And it's, I understand how hard it is to micromanage and manage people and things <laughs> like that because I hate it myself. But, um, so I think that not when you sign that property management agreement, don't think like, okay, I know my fees. I know everything. I'm good to go. I can walk away. And maybe there are those perfect property management companies out there. We don't have to have that oversight and to see those, um, you know, find those mistakes. So I would say keep watching for those fees and know what your fees are because there are human errors, just like any kind of invoicing and billing. Um, so just my advice would be to keep watching as you I use the property management company. It's funny you say that because I've always thought of it as the owner is the asset manager and they're overseeing not only their debt and, and, their property as a whole, you know, from higher up, but they're overseeing the property manager as well. Yeah, I think that's a common misconception that a lot of people have is that once you hire a property manager, you can just forget about the properties altogether. Um, when really there is still some active involvement from you as the owner to to make sure that a property managers have the right, uh, and I guess the, the authority to make the right decisions, right? And that b that they're doing everything that they're, they're supposed to do. I know I was a bottleneck for my property manager because they would send me something. They would send me a quote for something like, "Hey, do you want to get this fixed?" And it would take me like weeks to get back to them, right? So like I'm the one that's pissing off the tenant because I haven't responded to this quote from the property manager. So even as the owner, there's still a little. Bit bit of, uh, I guess, active work involved to make sure your property is being run the right way. That is such a great point because that was me too. The bottleneck of like, oh my gosh, <laughs> wait, this email, I just started it. That's why I have a Daryl now to <laughs> take care of all that. But um, yeah. yeah, that's such a great point as it can go both ways too. So moral of the story is everyone needs a Daryl, right? We all, we all got to find a Daryl. <laughs> I'm mean, definitely going to make sure he never listens to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> to add to that, I would say though, also, you know, back to the, the management agreement and the relationship is too, you can kind of set out some parameters and say, okay, you know, you can, you know, authorize up to a thousand dollars, let's say, you know, without me okaying it. And then anything over that, I got to know about it. So then you mm -hmm. kind of take that bottleneck away a little bit. 
That's a, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. Like we had to do, I think we do up to $500, but then also any appliance that was broken, non-working, even if it was more than $500, then they could go ahead and take care of it because for them to wait for me to respond to a fridge that is just completely shot, like go ahead and replace it for the tenant. What am I going to say? No, <laughs> no, nope, yeah. don't replace it. <laughs> so we had to um, add that into our management agreement too, is that any appliance that cannot be fixed or repaired, at least within a timely manner, would be um, replaced for the tenant without any authorization. So Karen, I want to talk a little bit more about the the reporting structure, right? We, we're talking a lot about uh, the the property owner uh, still being involved, and a lot of that involvement comes from the reports that the uh, the property manager prepares on behalf of the owner. So I guess just walk us through, like, what is the regular cadence of reporting that a PM should be following, and what kind of information should that property manager be providing to the property owner? My feeling is. And my experience in all these years is you basically want to give them anything and everything. Um, What we normally do is like an overview. And depending on the management contract, we'll either do it monthly or quarterly. And, you know, one thing is to advise them of all the different, you know, facilities issues, any collections issues. Um, we watch our tenants closely and make sure they carry the right insurance. And then of course we update them on what's going on with the leasing. And then in that package, you know, you've got the overview, then you've got the current operating statement with the month or the quarter, depending on how you're reporting and the year to date. And then you've also have a variance analysis whereby you explain to the owner you know, why something's off from the what you had budgeted, whether it was like a major repair that wasn't planned or you've got a tenant that's not paying and you're in the process of evicting them, things along that nature. Um, we include the general ledger. We include a um, cash receipts ledger. We include a payable ledger and we include the bank reconciliations. As much information as far as everything that that we've got on that particular company or that owner in our accounting system that we you know have our hands in we are constantly giving that information to the owner Karen what are you using any property management software at your company yeah we are currently using um, some software that was developed for my company it's proprietary but we're also looking at new software as well because um the property management company i use they use buildium which i've used before and also appfolio and they had it so that the owner could just log in to their portal anytime and pull everything all of those reports you listed and see where their property stood at any current day so i think that's like just technology does make it so much easier for the property manager to get the information out, but also the owner to retrieve the information. And then each month I get an owner statement emailed to me for each entity. And it just shows, you know, what the profit and loss was, the the current balance sheet and a breakdown of the transactions that happened that month. And then if I want to dig in even deeper, I can go in and log into my portal and see what's going on there. And then of course the the beginning cash balance and the ending cash balance and the trust account they have for that entity. That's good. That's real good. Yeah. First, let me make a statement. Like my property manager did not give me nearly as much uh, documentation <laughs> as what you just laid out. So maybe maybe a good thing that I'm, I'm, I'm not doing the long terms anymore. But um, I guess one, one question to, to you, Ashley. So does your property manager do all of your accounting for those properties as well? So like they have their own uh, QuickBooks account or are you taking their reports and then uploading that into your QuickBooks account? So they do a lot of the payables. Um, I still pay all of the mortgage payments. And a couple other bills, like we just got a, a roof done on some properties and I'm paying the the roofer directly instead of just mm-hmm. having the hassle of sending the money to the property management company and then, then paying the builder. Um, so they do a lot of the payables. And so the, a lot of the uh, property management software actually has bookkeeping built into it. So with Buildium, they just enter the trans- transactions into there. They can send payments through Buildium. They can, um, you know, print checks out of it. 
So they, all of their transactions, like a QuickBooks built into the software already. And then I can just print my report and then I add it into QuickBooks. And then it has any other transactions I did out of that entity into it. And then that's what goes to the accountant at the end of the year. But I think there are property owners that don't do any of the bookkeeping at all. And they just print off that final report. But um, I like to do the mortgages just to make sure that they stay paid. And every, and most of those are on automatic withdrawal anyways. But. Karen, is it the same for you and your tenants? Well, we no, most of ours... Our owners, we pay the mortgage, we pay the insurance, um, you know, and then we make a distribution at the end of each month based on how much the cash flow is. And a lot of times what we'll do is send them, you know, a list of the properties that we have of theirs and what that bottom cash flow is. And then they'll tell us, okay, you know, send me X amount of dollars. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, all of our accounting software is Peachtree and Yardy. And so we take whatever they need and we can just give it to their accountant, basically. Yeah. What about uh, property taxes? Do you pay a lot of the property taxes? Because that's one mm -hmm. thing I still pay, too, just because they get mailed to me and instead of sending them back. Yeah, them. no, we, we pay all the property taxes and we actually calculate it because we're commercial and we've got a lot of retail. Um, one of the things is one of our big anchor tenants, we have to send that their pro rata share bill within like 90 days of us receiving the bill. So, you know, we have to be able to track that and get it billed promptly so that that tenant will pay us back or pay the property back, I should say, within a time frame that, that their lease says. Because some of the leases will say if we don't bill them within that time frame, then they don't have to pay it. Uh, Karen, you've shared so much good information. I, I want to kind of keep going along the, this this thread here. So um, we, we talked a lot about what to, what to kind of look for as the property owner in a property manager. And you, you've shared it. I mean, you, honestly, you set the bar pretty high for what a property <laughs> manager should be doing. So I think even people that are listening right now are going to go back and have some, some tough conversations with their PMs. Um, but what are some other things that maybe we haven't touched on yet that you feel it's important as a real estate investor to look for when doing your due diligence on a potential property manager? Boy, I thought we covered a lot of it. Um, I would just have to say that that to me, the, the biggest and the most important thing is transparency. Uh, you want somebody that's going to tell you anything and everything you ask. You know, you don't want somebody that's going to feel like they, they can't tell you if there's, you know, a tenant that hasn't paid in six months. Um, so I would say transparency and communication, those are the two biggest things that I see. Karen, one, one follow-up for me, and this is something that I always think about as well, right, is that your, your property manager is like your first line of defense when it comes to keeping your tenants happy, right? Like for me, when I had my long-term rentals, I didn't even know what my tenants looked like because I was investing from multiple states away. Like my PM did everything. Um, so I could like literally walk past my tenant in the streets and we wouldn't even know who each other was, right? So it's there is really a lot of responsibility placed on the property manager to maintain that relationship. I guess, do you like, is, is tenant retention, like the, the, the property manager's ability to keep tenants happy? Like, I don't know, I guess, is there a way to, to kind of track that? And, and I guess how important is that uh, as a property manager? Oh, I think it's very important because, you know, owners don't necessarily realize every time that it's a lot more expensive for a business to move out and to release a space, because you're usually, you know, from commercial, you'll have it vacant for six months, sometimes a year. Um, so I would say that you've got to work with them. And there's so many creative avenues to work with them that people don't think about, you know, like if it's much more expensive to turn over a space than it is to say, for instance, you know, work with them and say, okay, they need a month's free rent, let's say. Well, then renew for 13 months. So then the owner basically is still getting their return and the tenant is getting something in exchange. 
Well, Karen, thank you so much for uh, sharing so much about property management yeah. with us. So, uh, so many good things. I've learned a lot. Yeah. Like so much. Yeah. This has been a great conversation. <laughs> Tony's changing his strategy not to buy and hold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But Karen, we also brought you onto the show today because you want to start investing yourself and you have, you are a wealth of knowledge and you definitely have the tools and resources to start investing. Um, but before we touch on that piece, I was just wondering if you have any kind of a tenant horror story or even property <laughs> owner horror story or something to share with us. Oh gosh. Um, there's so many I can't, I can't. I, I can't remember them all. It's funny because our CFO in this and in, in the company I work for now, she recently introduced uh, our new controller and basically told him, see, I told you, write this stuff down. You can't make it up. <laughs> um, I mean, and that was, I was dealing with a dead deer carcass somebody had dropped in the shopping center parking lot oh and was decomposing. <laughs> oh and do you know how hard it is to find somebody to haul off a dead deer carcass? <laughs> I wouldn't even know who I, to call. Like, who, I, who, who do you even call? <laughs> I bought a property recently that actually had a dead deer, like half laying in the pond, half out. <laughs> and so when I did my initial walkthrough of the property, it was there. So it was joked that it was the dead deer pond, we called it. And then, but it takes so long to close in New York State. So when we did our final walkthrough for closing, it was like already decomposed and it was just a <laughs> pile of bones there. Yeah, I don't know what's crazier, like the fact that, that the owner didn't get rid of the deer or the fact that it takes so long to close in New York State that a deer can literally <laughs> decompose <laughs> during escrow. Those are those are both crazy things. Yeah, so Tony, just watch out. The dead, you haven't been, made it in real estate I yet. I have my so dead, dead deer, deer story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're going to find one floating in a hot tub in Joshua Tree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Karen, let's get into, you know, maybe we could help you somehow. We we have a segment called um, the Rookie Exam, and we thought that we would actually twist it this time and kind of turn it around. And usually we ask our guests some questions, and we thought that maybe you could ask us um, some questions that you had about real estate investing and how we could help you uh, get started. Oh, well, thank you. I would say the first thing I need an answer to is, is, you know, how do you get over that fear of not being able to do it? You know, I think I've caught myself in analysis paralysis more times than I care to admit. What is your fear that's going to happen? I think my biggest fear is, is not from the standpoint that anything's going to happen so much as I just don't know how to come up with the money to actually do it, you know, and because all of my, you know, history is in commercial property, that's what I tend to look at because I know it the best. And so it's also going to be higher priced than if I went out and bought, say, you know, a duplex or a quadruplex. So you would prefer the commercial investing? Yeah. Even if it does cost more? Yeah, because it's it's what I know. It's really what I know. And I wouldn't have to hire a property manager. <laughs> yeah. The, the first thing that I, I think off the top of my head is, okay, you are the property manager for all of these owners. I think the first thing you need to do is put a little bug in their ear that if they would ever like to sell, let you know. Or if anybody else they know wants to sell, let them know. And I think going for seller financing would be a huge advantage is asking for that seller financing and you know, saying as a property is an investor, they're used to receiving this monthly income and use that as kind of a, a pitching point is that, you know, they'd still get monthly income doing the seller financing or taking on a partner. That, I mean, that's how me and Tony pretty much got started was a partner too. Yeah. I think that's probably what I'm going to need to do is take on a partner. And I guess, you know, some advice on how to find someone might, you know, help me out a lot. Cause even though I'm currently managing for a lot of private investors right now, I have an ethical dilemma because I don't want to be basically playing in the same sandbox I work in. I don't think that that's necessarily something that should stop you, Karen, right? I mean, I think as long as you're agnostic in terms of how you treat all of the property, so it doesn't ma matter whether it's yours or whether it's one of your clients, as long as they're all treated equally, 
and you can say that with a straight face to your property managers or to your property owners, I don't think that should hold you back. And if it really, if it really is like a big sticking point for you, then don't be afraid to maybe get out of that sandbox that you know, and maybe go a little bit further out or some other market where you can still take your expertise and your abilities, but maybe apply them in a new market that isn't overlapping with where you work. But you, you talked a little bit about potentially finding a, finding a partner, right? And I think you are the ideal person <laughs> to partner with another <laughs> investor. Because I know if I'm someone who's like listening to this podcast and say I have the the capital, I have the ability to get approved for a loan, but I don't have the ability or the desire to actually manage the property once we close, I'm going to need somebody to work with. And I would much rather work with someone that has you know, a wealth of knowledge and experience is someone that's just getting started. So I think for you, Karen, the challenge is how can you expose yourself and your your expertise and your abilities to more and more people? So in my mind, that's going to local real estate meetups. That's getting active on bigger pockets in the forums. That's getting active in the in the real estate focused Facebook groups, the real estate rookie Facebook groups. That's going to events like BPCon. And if every time someone posts a question in the forum about property management in Charlotte, if you're the first person to answer, I guarantee over time, someone is going to reach out to you with some kind of partnership opportunity. So I think you just need to kind of, you know, stake your, you know, put your flag in the ground as Karen, the property manager expert of, of the Charlotte area. And eventually you're going to find the right person to work with. Yeah. I think that's such a great point. Tony is, you know, just putting yourself out there and especially going to meetups and Facebook groups, because you have so many resources available to you, Karen, that a lot of other people starting out don't have, and that is going to make you so much more valuable as a partner. Um, I, we start off very similar, both being property managers. And I found a partner who gave me the capital. He knows nothing about real estate investing, doesn't care, but he knew that I didn't trust me because I had experience in that market and managing properties. And as far as the deal analysis and having that analysis paralysis, you have seen so many properties and you know in your market what is going to be a good property, what tenants are going to be looking for in the commercial space. So I think you going and looking at a deal, you'll have some kind of insight that especially out of state investors won't have because you go to so many commercial properties in the area anyways, and you'll have that unique expertise too. Yeah, I appreciate that, Ashley, because I do kind of pride myself on being able to you know, spot discrepancies written and ways to lower expenses and increase income, you know, just looking at properties sometimes. Well, Karen, um, thank you so much for uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge. And hopefully that was um, a little bit of help to you. And I, I bet you will have some people reaching out to you after <laughs> this to <laughs> potentially partner with you after hearing your expertise on property management. Um, I just want to give a shout out uh, before we close out today to today's rookie rock star. It is Kevin Christensen, who we've actually had on the podcast before way in the beginning. Uh, so Kevin, you've made it. You're the rookie rock star. Um, he just wanted to talk about the importance of buying right. Uh, he picked up a property. It's literally across the street from one of his other rentals, paid 105,000 for the house, did 55,000 reno, and it appraised for 210,000. This other house needs far less work. He made an offer of 50,000. It was accepted. Um, he's using hard money. And today at closing, he got a check back for $1,185. So essentially got paid to purchase this house. Um, he expects the reno to cost him 35,000 to 40,000 40, all in, and it should take about eight to 10 weeks. Um, so his point is to make your money on the purchase side, guys. Uh, the seller called him. He did zero marketing and will be all in for under 90K on this house. Um, so awesome job, Kevin. And Kevin was also on the Real Estate Rookie podcast, gave a wealth of knowledge about doing uh, subject to deals. So if you guys are interested in that, uh, go back and check him out. Well, Karen, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Can you let everyone know where they can reach out to you and find out some more information? Yeah, sure. Um, I've got a website. It's allisonproperty.com. And then also my company work site is um, primexproperties.com. And my email is at k lane l-a-n-e, at primaxservices.com. 
I also have a personal email of allison.assoc at gmail. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we appreciated you taking the time to come on with us today. Um, and you guys reach out to Karen if you have property management questions or if you want to partner with her in the Charlotte market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals. He's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. And you guys slide into our DMs if you have questions or you want to be featured as our rookie rock star and join our Facebook group, Real Estate Rookie. And if you're loving the show, please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform. And we will be back on Saturday with a rookie reply. Still